Am I good enough to publish the projects I feel called to pursue? Who knows? Who cares? It is so exhausting to care. And worse, to allow that caring to stop the creative process. I know, these are champagne problems and questions. That's one of the voices I hear most loudly, asking me to kindly step aside so that others working on more vital human rights issues can take center stage. But what if something I create helps even those wonderful people step forward in some new, expanded way? Can't we all serve each other? This is your time. How can we earn twice as much in half the time with joy and ease while serving the highest good? That is our guiding question here at the Free Time Cafe, your home for heart-based business. I'm your host, Jenny Blake. Join me for conversations with authors, friends, and fellow business owners as we explore ways to free your mind, time, and team to do your best work. Now, on to today's show. Welcome back, free timers. Today's post is a cross post from my Substack, Rolling in Dough, Divine Disaster Diaries from a Breadwinning Business Owner Living in New York City. This is where I share personal essays about the real nitty gritty behind the scenes of running a business. My friend Leanne calls it business reality TV. My husband Michael says it's like sex in the city, but about money. So if you want to join us over at Doe for short, I would love for you to be part of that community too. Visit rollingindoe.substack.com or itsfreetime.com slash secret. You can also follow me directly on my profile page at substack.com slash at Jenny Blake. I also highly encourage you to check out the Substack app so that you can read essays like this and from tons of other writers that you admire and enjoy from within the app and outside of the chaos of your email inbox. Without further ado, here's today's excerpt, and I'll be sure to link to the written version of this post in the show notes. Ignore the odds, status games on steroids, and skulls from seatmates. Saturday, July 1st. Ben Horowitz writes, startup CEOs should not play the odds. When you're building a company, you must believe there is an answer, and you cannot pay attention to your odds of finding it. You just have to find it. It matters not whether your chances are 9 in 10 or 1 in 1,000. Your task is the same. We are not meant to compare ourselves to 8 billion people. I know I'm not the first to remind you that social platforms, including Substack, are status games on globalized steroids. With so much exposure to people who are actually smarter, funnier, prettier, and or fill-in-the-blanker, the logical conclusion would be not to jump in, right? In zero-sum logic, this is correct. If you can't be the best author, the best podcaster, the best thinker about your topic, the prettiest, skinniest, curviest, strongest in physical appearance, why try? Even as I type these words, I'm struggling to hear my own voice amidst a rapidly accelerating onslaught of mental catalog cards from other writers who have expressed their thoughts on this very topic earlier than me, and better than me. When I saw that Emily Ratatowski launched a podcast, High Low with Emrata, I was mesmerized by her cover art. It was a close-up of her face, trendy misshapen bangs, full red pouty lips. What would it be like to go through the world with a face like that? I wondered, a hot wave of insecurity washing over me. Does it mean I shouldn't put my own face on my cover art? No, it doesn't. Taste is subjective, as is personal experience. You are unique when placed in the precise context that is this moment in history, with these technological tools at your fingertips, with your unique mind and life experiences and constraints, and with how your soul's expressive signature resonates, or not, with the people you're meant to reach. If you take the next exit off of the highway to winning or being the best, you might encounter an interesting scenic detour. Can the highway to winning do great things for your career? Sure. But what if you're miserable along the drive? I remember how gripped by fear I felt while riding as a backseat passenger in a Tesla many years ago. We were heading down a wide six-lane Southern California road. The driver had his hands off the wheel and was floating through conversation, eyes concerningly off the road. 
The car started accelerating toward a red light, and next thing I know, we're blasting through it. The driver hadn't even noticed that the light was red. Thankfully, no one else was coming toward us from a perpendicular lane. Later, the car accelerated again toward a stop sign, only to screech ungracefully to a halt just in the nick of time. It was all just too fast and unpredictable for my comfort. We got where we were going, but at what emotional cost? Maybe Tesla has fixed these types of glitches by now, but I still can't shake that memory of nerves multiplied by car sick nausea. This is not how I want to get where I'm going. In free time, I share a mantra that how we bake is as important as what we make. The energetic fingerprints of what we're creating are embedded in the final output and will even inform that product's resonance in the market. Every day, I start to talk myself out of writing or sharing something here because it has already been said better, funnier, more clearly, or by someone more famous. I cringe while I write, noting all the cliches. It harkens back to the time my tough-as-nails New York literary agent told me upon submitting the first draft of the Pivot book proposal that my writing skill wasn't up to par and that I needed to take some classes. I subsequently bought a bunch of books on how to avoid cliches, but didn't read them and failed to sign up for any in-depth writing courses through NYU. Oops. So every day that you see a post go live at Rolling in Dough, it also means that I've talked myself back into the game. Not the game of trying to be the best, the game of trying to express myself best. So what if I have basic taste, middle of the road intelligence, plain looking and aging, no glowing tan, and not nearly as fit as I used to be. Maybe I'm mediocre at many aspects of running a business. Or maybe I'm not any of those things. Is it possible to be truly objective about one's true talents and deficits? If so, that would imply some governing body had the definitive answer on how to hierarchically place each of eight plus billion people, somehow mapping the Rubik's Cube of our composite personalities and physical bodies to an approval worthiness scale. Am I good enough to publish the projects I feel called to pursue? Who knows? Who cares? It is so exhausting to care. And worse, to allow that caring to stop the creative process. I know, these are champagne problems and questions. That's one of the voices I hear most loudly, asking me to kindly step aside so that others working on more vital human rights issues can take center stage. But what if something I create helps even those wonderful people step forward in some new, expanded way? Can't we all serve each other? We'll be right back just after this. The days that our species spent traveling in tribal bands didn't expose us to the entirety of humankind on a daily basis. Basket weavers didn't flick mindlessly through an endless scroll of fancier, better baskets before making the one that would hold their bread. Hunters didn't post photos of their kill, comparing sizes, before feeding their extended community. The generous ones did what they needed to do for the greater good. We are not meant to compare ourselves to 8 billion people. Why should I be the judge of my work before it's published? What am I so afraid of? that no one will find it, it will get lost in a sea of voices, that no one will like it even if they do find it, that the ones who read it will hate or at least dislike something I say, or worse, a way that I think or behave. I'll say something wrong and offend people I care about. I'll say something wrong that will catalyze a reputational disaster I may never recover from. Maybe I'll offend potential corporate clients who don't even exist yet in my orbit or balance sheet and stop them from hiring me so that I can further sanitize my thoughts when I deliver them to their audience. These fears exist, and maybe each has a kernel or a whole microwavable popcorn bag full of truth. But the fear that's bigger than all of that, that no one will even have a chance to decide for themselves, that I live as a shell of myself because I'm too scared to share what's inside, giving the gift of experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, Speaking of overused phrases that are nonetheless apt and convey exactly what I want to say, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas records Jesus as saying, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth 
will destroy you. There's a reason this gospel didn't make it into the canon after the first council of Nicaea. It's about going within. That truth lies within each of us, and that we must bring it forth to save our own lives without waiting for the people in power to show us the way. In his 2008 book, Status Anxiety, Alain de Baton excavates reasons for our fascination with ruins. He writes, Ruins bid us to surrender our strivings and our fantasies of perfection and fulfillment. They remind us that we cannot defy time and that we are merely the playthings of forces of destruction which can at best be kept at bay but never vanquished. We may enjoy local victories, perhaps claim a few years in which we are able to impose a degree of order upon the chaos, but ultimately all will slot back into primeval soup. If this prospect has the power to console us, it is perhaps because the greater part of our anxieties stems from an exaggerated sense of the importance of our own projects and concerns. We are tortured by our ideals and by a punishingly high-minded sense of the gravity of what we are doing. He continues, Christian moralists have long understood that to the end of reassuring the anxious, they will do well to emphasize that contrary to the first principle of optimism, everything will in fact turn out for the worst. The ceiling will collapse, the statue will topple, we will die, everyone we love will vanish, and all our achievements and even our names will be trod underfoot. We may derive some comfort from this, however, if a part of us is able instinctively to recognize how closely our miseries are bound up with the grandiosity of our ambitions, to consider our petty status worries from the perspective of a thousand years hence is to be granted a rare, tranquilizing glimpse of our own insignificance. I wrote this essay one week before launching the Rolling in Dough Substack while on a cross-country flight from New York City to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Nothing will put these who-cares principles into practice like having to wear a swimsuit in public. Thus, enter what a friend and I dubbed the caftan plan. Upon finishing this draft after four hours in flight, I politely asked my seatmate if I can get up to go to the bathroom. Before complying, she delivered a death stare. Her eye roll and macro expression of contempt were unmissable and unmistakable. Had she been reading over my shoulder? Did I inadvertently offend her? If so, is it because I sneezed earlier? Was she already having a bad day before sitting next to me? My mind scanned for all possible reasons that I could be the cause of her disgusted countenance. Most likely her mood had nothing to do with me, and yet reflexively I jumped to half a dozen conclusions that would explain how and why I had so thoroughly disrupted her. I could only chuckle to myself as I sat back down. Case an effing point. You just can't win them all. I hope you enjoyed that essay from Rolling in Dough. That's just one of many. I'm publishing twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 11, 11 a.m. And if you want to read the full archives and get full posts in the future, I would love for you to join us. Learn more and sign up at itsfreetime.com slash secret or rollingindoh.substack.com. You can also follow me directly on Substack, even if you don't want to subscribe to any of my three publications, Pivot, Free Time, or Rolling in Dough. You can just see what I'm reading, what I'm restacking, quotes that I like from other publications on Substack. That's something that I really appreciate, just the social and community element that they've created there. You can follow me directly on my profile page at substack.com slash at Jenny Blake. That's substack.com slash at Jenny Blake. And one of my favorite things about this platform is that you can see everything I'm creating across the internet, all in one place on that profile page. See you there. If you've listened this far, you get a gold star. Thank you. Word of mouth is the most joyful way we can grow this show. And it helps us land interviews with the luminaries and insightful guests that you would most love to hear from. Please send this episode to a friend who might find it helpful. And for show notes and related links from this episode, visit itsfreetime.com. While you're there, make sure you're subscribed to the Time Well Spent newsletter. You'll get instant access to my tech toolkit, a continually updated list of all the software I use, along with the total monthly spend to run my business, where no one works full-time, even me. 
visit itsfreetime.com slash join. Remember, you are running the show. It's time for radical reimagining and everything is up for grabs. Let it be easy. Let it be fun and build with love.